baby right off.
This is Michael McKeon, a.k.a. Morris Fletcher, a.k.a. Chuck McGill. You know who I am. But it's time for Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. You're watching Inside the Gilliverse, talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Brought to you by the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. For all your favorite characters from the Gillivers, shop the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. Also brought to you by Rode Microphones, the official microphone supplier of Inside the Gillivers. See their entire lineup today at Rode.com. Now, please welcome your host, Eric Broadbent. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Season 2, Episode 2 of Inside the Gilverse, where we talk all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. My name is Eric Broadbent, and it comes with extreme pleasure to welcome tonight's guest. You know him as Walter White's uh, boss, Bogdan, from Breaking Bad. A pleasure to have you here, Mr. Marius Stan, actor and scientist Marius Stan. How you doing, my friend? Oh, thank you, Eric, for inviting me. I'm doing fine uh, here in Chicago where uh, the winter is not as bad as we, we, we thought. So uh, I'm glad I hear you are in Canada, and I, I bet the viewers are all over the place. So uh, a warm uh, hello from Chicago to everybody. Thank you. And yes, we're, we're blessed right now in Canada as well, too. I, well, we're blessed depending on how you look at it. If you're a person in Canada that likes your winters and your snow for Christmas and things like that, we're not so blessed. And I do know, as you say, Chicago can be a, a horrible place in the wintertime. Uh, sometimes so it's nice to hear that you're good over there and it's uh, green grass over here in Ontario Canada as well too but yeah our viewers go from uh, Germany to Japan to you know Venezuela to Mexico United States Canada anywhere between so and uh, that's why it's sometimes it's tough to get some of our viewers tuning in live because of the time zones uh, last week we had Ben from uh, Germany so we had to go live at three o'clock in the afternoon just to accommodate the time zones but it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, we're we're going to have some fan questions uh, by audio tonight, some fan questions coming from our live chat. Uh, but, you know, myself, um, as a fan of the show, it's a real honor to have you here. And just and, and you've got such a story, too, that we'll talk about. I mean, an accidental, beautiful find that became this acting career. Uh, so I'll jump into one of my, a couple of my questions here. I have two of them, and then I'm going to turn it over to those audio questions that I told you about off the air. Uh, and then, you know what? Before we do that, maybe we can even do a little bit of a birthday celebration. So we have Sheev in the chat. It's Sheev's birthday today and Lisa's birthday today. And yesterday was Andrea. Do you think we could get a happy birthday for Sheev, Lisa, and Andrea? Happy birthday, Sheev, Lisa, and Andrea. And uh, have a great Healthy and joyful 2021. Now that is nice. There you go, uh, ladies. <laughs> I hope you enjoy that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. That's nice. A very nice birthday wish for sure. So the question I had for you is, um, you, know, you moved young. Well, I shouldn't say young. You moved from Romania to, to USA uh, to continue on with like a, this, you know, your career in science. How, how old were you when you moved? I was uh, 35 almost. And uh, uh, indeed, it was uh, uh, a special circumstance. In fact, I, we did not think it would be possible to move to the United States. It was a dream. Many people uh, my age and back in Romania would uh, have thought about that. And it, that was accidental in a sense, too. Really? Uh, I applied for a, for a job, for a postdoctoral job. And uh, I was talking with my wife, Liliana, and we were saying, is it worth submitting the paperwork for this? Are they going to hire an, a Romanian guy all the way from Europe? Uh, they have better people right there. And uh, uh, in the end, we said, OK, it's going to be kind of expensive for us. We, in Romania back then, uh, life was not uh, uh, that easy. And we mailed all the documents. And one day, in the mailbox, we found the letter. We offer your position. If you accept it, we can hire you. And it, it all went from there. So sometimes I, I always thought, and I tell everybody, it's good to take your chance. Yeah. To be there. In, it could be that it's going to work just fine, as unlikely as it seems. Did you, did you open the letter first? Did your wife open it? Did you jump up and uh -huh. hug? 
I don't. I think we were both in in in, uh, in our apartment uh, and opened it together and looked at that and said, "Oh, we got it. I got it. We got it." That's and, beautiful. And I I like a like a good pioneer. You remember the Western movies, and I came in uh, April of nineteen ninety seven just by myself to 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 mark the territory, to, to, to uh, put a spear in the ground. Or, <laughs> to, and uh, then uh, my wife and our two children, who were eight and five at the time, uh, joined in June of the same year. And it was a happy, happy reunion at the airport. I can imagine. So the, is the family loving America now, obviously? I would, I would say so. I think they, at least they look happy. <laughs> <laughs> they, seem, they seem to be pleased with this move. Well, all of us uh, enjoy um, United States very much. Good. Well, I'm I'm glad that you and your wife are there together because you know so you, you know maybe you were uh, uh, she might have been traveling or she could have been at work away from home and that's big news. Uh-huh. You want to be there together for that. Sure. That's great. Um, no, my second question for you before I jump into the audio questions: Were you gifted in school, like as a, as a young kid? I mean, we, most people don't just hop into science and they're really good at it. They're they're good all the way along. I was a very bad student. I th- I, I I was a lazy student. I'll just be honest. And I, science class was cool to me. It intrigued me, but it, I found it difficult, and I didn't give it the the chance that I should have. But were you naturally gifted um, in science in school? Ah. Um, uh... Let me let me explain briefly what I think my gift was. Okay. It was not physics, which is my bachelor's degree, nor chemistry, which ended up being my uh, PhD. It was math. Math. I was gifted gifted for mathematics. So I I sometimes say that uh, I am a scientist by profession, but I am a mathematics lover. Math is my lover. I always loved math. And it could be that because of that, because math came easy to me, um, I ended up in, in uh, doing physics and, and uh, chemistry. And um, I have to say that uh, at the time in high school, for example, I would love uh, reading and also writing uh, prose and poetry and other things. Never tried theater at the time, never had no experience for that. And I didn't think I have an inclination for that. So, Mm -hmm. but to your question, it's all, it was all because of math. It's important. And here again, too, I hate to show, to display all my weaknesses. Math is another weakness. I can count invoices when I send off bills to customers. I can count that money pretty good. Um, but other than that, I struggle with it. And I always tell my son, who's 14, be 15 this March, how important math is. And he's, and he's actually better than I am. You know, uh, he's in high school now, and he has a better uh, grasp than I do. But it's very, very important. So there were things that didn't came. Uh, didn't come easy to me in in school. For mm-hmm. example, I would say uh, history. I didn't like memorizing dates and years. I, I was fascinated by history as a story, but not necessarily learning all that stuff or music. I hope n- neither you nor any of the, the people in the audience will ask me to sing anything. <laughs> so uh, all people have some things that come easy to them and they like them. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that is a gift to be treasured. It, it doesn't have to be everything. No, Whatever right. it is, you live with that and make the most out of it. That's right. And I, I have a feeling, I'm not going to put you up to the test, so don't worry, but I have a feeling you probably could <laughs> sing a good song. I uh, bet you, do you sing around the uh, holidays or anything like that with the family or b- birthdays and things maybe? Oh, no. I have a guitar and I I, uh, I sometimes play the guitar and sing for for dear friends who will forgive me <laughs> for <laughs> for that. It isn't guitar for, do you like guitar? I do. I do like guitar. I do uh, like classical guitar mm-hmm. uh, and uh, also contemporary guitar players. Santana is one of my favorite but also uh, many others. I, I, I enjoy listening to, to guitar in all forms. Yeah, I, I, I love guitar. It brings me great joy. Uh, whatever your instrument is of choice, whether it be keyboard, uh, you know, piano or guitar, you know, your, your musical instrument will always be there for you. It doesn't care if you're having a bad day or a good day. It's there for you. And that's why I love it so much. But it's nice to know you got some musical background as well. It's fantastic. We have what's called a super chat question that just came in from Lisa. 
She says, uh, do you believe your character was given the credit he deserved in owning a car wash as a Romanian, or would you have liked to see him do something different? Um, now, I, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, brings us to Bogdan, who, who is now uh, a person in some people's mind, uh, walking the streets of Chicago and uh, somebody that people salute and approach in the airports. Uh, let me just say that initially, I don't know if it was supposed to be Romanian. I don't think it was supposed to be Romanian. Bogdan is a common name in Southeastern Europe. It's, uh, you can find it in Poland. Uh, you can have find it in uh, most of the Slavic and uh, Balkanic countries in Europe. So uh, I don't know if it was uh, initially Romanian, but then it became once I was cast in that role and let me say that I did like the role. I didn't wish anything else but <laughs> being uh, 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 Walter's boss and making his life miserable to a point where he decided to break bad, right? So yeah. I, I think Bogdan was one of the many things that made um, Bogdan break, break bad. And also I, I liked what was written, what I found in blogs and uh, in media about Bogdan, uh, things like he was the only um, uh, nemesis, nemesis, nemesis. Of, of Walter who was not a criminal himself. Yeah. Or uh, in a in a in a ranking of the most likely characters to kill Walter White in the final episode, uh, Bogdan was number five. Wow. <laughs> so, so I thought it. it it was well written, and this is credit to the writers. Yeah, and uh, well directed for all the directors I, I've been working with, and I am happy with the way it turned out. That, I, that's I good. Think it was good. I think the only crime uh, Bogdan could have been charged with is maybe paying his employees uh, too little, maybe. Oh yeah, that could, <laughs> minimum that wage. Could be, yeah. That's right. So, you know, the boss, you know, the uh, I love what you said about, you know, as you have to be tough. The boss has to be tough. No, that was fantastic. So, okay, let's jump over to some of these audio questions. I have two. This is from our members. So, people, if you want to do this next time, uh, down below on our channel, there's an option called Join. You can hit that. You can become a member. You can send in your audio questions, plus a bunch of other cool stuff as well, too. That's not the only thing you get. But this is from Karina. Karina's in the chat right now, and here is her audio question. I'll play it for you now. Hi, Marius. My name is Karina, and my question is... Um, your kids all got cast as extras on Breaking Bad when they went to audition. What was the reaction from your kids when you got asked to do a speaking line in the pilot? Great question. So, um, again, uh, they are my kids. I love them dearly. Uh, I could not read their mind at the time. I still cannot read their mind. And they are uh, 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 close to 30 now. Uh, um, I thought they were... I felt that they, they were happy for me because I, I got that role. Uh, maybe they were a bit disappointed that there was not a chance for them. Mm -hmm. I think at, at the end, we all came to peace with the fact that the role was the owner of a car wash. Yeah. And of the four, out of the four of us, my, my wife and the two kids, I was the only one who could, who can fit the profile. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it just happened. It's, uh, I, I don't feel and I hope that they do not feel that I took anything away from them. I, they were uh, in middle school. They could not possibly play this role. No, and no. They, they seemed happy to, to be part of the pilot which was a joy for them. I never really even entertained that thought, how it could feel, you know, between, you know, father and kids. You know, okay, so yeah, can you, dad, can you give me a ride down to go audition for this role? Okay, let's go. And next thing you know, we got bogged on. He's a star in five, six episodes, you know? Uh, like, I could see that. But yeah, no one could have taken that role from the family. So that's cool. That's really cool. Here's a question coming in from Lori, and I know what this is, and I told you a little bit about this one off the air, and, uh, and we'll have a conversation about this one. But this is from Lori. Hello, Marius. This is Lori. In the TV series Crash, three Breaking Bad actors appeared in Season 2, Episode 1. The actors were Stephen Michael Caseda, who played Gomi, Tess Harper, that played Jesse Pinkman's mom, and you, who played Bogdan. I'm curious to know if you saw one another on set when you were filming the episode. Thank you. Nice. Great question. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, the answer is no. 
I did not uh, run in, into them. The scene I was shooting involved me primarily at the, uh, as Imran, who was the owner of a small shop that was vandalized by some teenagers. So the focus on that day, it was a, a morning, I believe, was on that scene and no other characters were part of that scene. So, yeah, I wish I, I had a chance to meet them as I had a chance to, to meet uh, several actors and characters in Breaking Bad, but uh, it wasn't the case for Crash. Yeah, and, and I, was, I was telling you as well too, off air, I had no idea about this and I felt so bad. I was telling Lori about this, Lori, when I was talking to her about her question, I said, I looked up Crash and I had no idea it was, uh, it was uh, Glenn Rosaro was the sh- uh, showrunner. And I, Glenn's a good friend of mine. And I, because I love The Walking Dead so much, I was a big fan of Walking Dead when he was showrunner for that tail end of season two through the start of season four. And so I have to uh, contact him and apologize to him. Uh, Glenn, uh, I miss this uh, pretty big feature that you've done. Uh, but I'll tell him we had uh, Marius on the show. And uh, that, that's cool that you had a part in that as well. Yeah, very nice. So good question from Lori. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, good. She has great questions. Everyone does. They're great questions all the time. Uh, Sheev, who is one of the birthday celebrators, says, um, Marius, is working on the Breaking Bad, or when working on the Breaking Bad pilot, did you feel that this was something really special in the making? And you kind of alluded to that, how much you liked working on that, but did you did you feel like, because a lot of people, including Vince Gilligan, he didn't even know this was going to take off. He was like, okay, we're going to make it through the end of the season. Had no idea it was going to grow legs and go. Did you feel in your gut that it was something special? So I did, but I, I'm not sure how justified I was in having that feeling because I'm, I was not an experienced actor. I was not an actor at all at that time, had no experience. I didn't know. I couldn't tell if how exactly uh, uh, an episode in a TV series should be shot. Mm-hmm. But the gut feeling was originated in the, the fact that Everything was done in what I felt as a scientist at the time, in that moment. It was a professional way. So every scene was prepared well, was shot multiple times from different angles. We would uh, repeat some scenes because the light had to be perfect. Uh, Vince Gilligan, who directed, the, you know, he directed uh, most, if not all, the first and last episodes of each series. He paid a lot of attention to details. He, he had discussions. He spoke with me, discussed with me the role and what is going in. So I was surprised in the most pleasant way by the, the, the complexity of this process. And I felt on the spot that this is not the ordinary TV series that sometimes is shot with one fixed camera and actors go left and right and say their lines and then go away and then they, it took us uh, half a day to shut, to shoot five minutes or so. Wow. So that made me believe that, you know, every single episode is made, is made, made as if it was a movie, a yeah. feature movie. And because of that, I thought maybe this is going to be something to remember. It's going to make a mark in, in the TV uh, industry. And it did. And that there's that's a point I made later on in the, in the evening's uh, questions here today, but I'll, I'll address it now because it's it's uh, pertinent. That's where I think science and, uh, you know, the attention to details in science is so important, right? You know, make sure you, everything is calculated and you know what you're, you're hoping what your end result is going to produce. You're, you're following that flow chart, so to speak. And when I had um, Mark Margolis, who plays Hector Salamanca on the show two weeks back, um, he was mentioning a scene, you know, where, where Walter White basically blows up Gus Fring with the aid of Hector Salamanca. So they're in they're in the retirement home, and Vince Gilligan's obviously in there, very, doing everything he's doing, choreographing things. And there was curtains uh, for Hector Salamanca's um, curtains. They were blowing out the window, and Vince was like playing for probably half an hour or more with these curtains, pulling them out of the window, pulling them back in, putting them out a little bit. And Mark Margolis says. Literally to Vince, he says, if if uh, if it all comes down to these curtains, uh, and that's going to make or break the show, uh, we're in we're in deep shit. And Vince goes, it's all in the details, Mark. It is. It is. I, I'm going to confirm this with with a, a, a brief story of my my own. My character, maybe you've seen Bogdan, uh, uh, was passionate about uh, sweaters. 
Uh, mm -hmm. In most of the scenes, we'll have a collar shirt and over that a sweat. I've learned that Vince was involved in choosing the sweaters wow. because he cared about colors. And I invite everybody to watch, to monitor how colors play a critical role in this series. The purple, think of Marie's yes. uh, scenes. And there is a quite complex uh, chromatic of the movie. So attention to detail is key. And I've learned another thing uh, uh, that I want to share with you as a scientist. I thought that artists are, are kind of bohemian. They will grab a beer and uh, smoke a cigar and say, hey guys, are you ready? Let's make a movie. Let's shoot it. It's not like that. In no. fact, they might be quite relaxed during the creation process, the creative process. But once on set, they're highly disciplined. I was surprised when I returned from the movies and I've seen how people with light, uh, working on the lights, on the sound, uh, the uh, uh, screenplay, uh, uh, the writers were there, the, the assistant producers, everybody will come together at the exact time, if he said 6.20 in the morning, you'd be there at 6.20 in the morning. And I told my colleague scientists, guys, we, we need to, to borrow some, some rules from uh, regarding uh, planning and discipline from the movie industry. And, and they are laughing about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it's very well organized on set. That's, that's good to know. I, I assume so, for sure. Uh, here's a super chat question from Josh Gordon. Um, how was it? To, how was working with Bill Burr? Uh, was he was he joking? I said, obviously a very very funny man. Um, but was he serious as well too, or did he turn off? Uh, did he turn off the the funniness and get into the role? Well, his character was funny on the show too, but uh, indeed. Uh, so uh, I was lucky to to meet him and and work with him on a, an episode uh, directed by David uh, uh, Slade, a British director. And uh, I confess, I didn't know much about Bill Burr. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was a very nice, he is a very nice uh, individual in our private uh, warming up conversations, if you want, as well as during the breaks. We will crack a joke, he will tell something, I will say something. But then the role, his role, uh, his character, his character was supposed to trick me into believing that uh, the car wash uh, was breaking some environmental rules. So he took that very seriously and uh, really drove me mad. I mean, Bogdan, yeah. drove Bogdan mad. And we had a, a, a scene where I, I would grab his collar and push him away a little bit. And uh, it became a, a little bit intense. But outside, outside the character, uh, he's a quite pleasant and a funny man in, in real life. I, I like his work a lot, and obviously watching him in Mandalorian as well, too. He's really shining in that. And, I mean, a great comedian. But that, that's a good story to hear about him as well. Yeah, I just saw Karina say Bill Burr is great on The Mandalorian. And uh, Eamon Wise is here as well, too, in the chat. Um, yeah, a great, a great actor. Here is a super chat question from Shashank. Uh, I'm just going to go back and grab it again. He says, could you share... Um, okay, yeah, and you kind of touched base on this, but he's asking, could you share what, what was your experience working with Vince Gilligan as a director? So, yeah, you touched base on it. Um, was something, an experience you'll probably never forget. Yes, indeed. He, he, he was absolutely uh, uh, wonderful, especially because I was an inexperienced actor. Mm -hmm. So he, took, he had the patience to work with me to explain some things. I have to say that, uh, in addition, I was uh, lucky to work with uh, three more directors. David, uh, I mentioned David, then also uh, Michelle McLaren from Canada. Mm -hmm. Hi to all Can Canadians. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Michael Slovis. Yeah. Uh, and Eric, you had Michael Slovis. And let me say that they had very different styles. And I, I can briefly summarize them. Yeah. So. I don't know, uh, Michelle, Michelle uh, would take me uh, to some quiet place and we would look at the, 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 the script and she would say, okay, how do you plan to, to do this? And I would say, okay, $20 million. You don't know that uh, you're Walter's wife and uh, he didn't have the courage to come here and say, okay, how else? 
and I will try another one. Oh, 20 million dollars. Don't you think I know who you are? And, and then she'll say, okay, let's go to the, with the last one. In contrast, David Blaine would say, you are doing it beautifully. We just need to shoot this from five, six, seven, eight, 12 angles. So we will do that thing. He, he will not interfere much with how we want it, Bill Burr and I, for example. Okay. And then you had Michael Slovis with a very different style. Michael was uh, 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 a fan of fine tuning. He would say, Michael, how do you want to say this? And I would say, um, you know, the real important thing, and not everybody knows this, is to be tough. So can you be tough, Walter? And he would say, excellent, excellent, outstanding. No. Can you, can you inflict more pain? I said, oh, the real important thing, and not everybody knows this, is to be tough. Okay. And then we'll come and say, even more, even Twist. more, like uh, uh, even more. And, uh, and it ended up the, the way it ended, especially the last part where I said, and, and if not, you can always call your wife. Huh? <laughs> and Brian, Brian was outraged himself, <laughs> not only the character. <laughs> Man, uh, you can be mean. <laughs> so, but you see three different, four different directors, each of them with their style, their way of, of guiding the actor. The, in the end, it's the actor who creates the character, but the, the director can make adjustments, can, can direct that flow, creative mm -hmm. flow, in very different ways, as I said, depending on their style, their personality. Just like the producer in the recording studio. I mean, the musician comes in with uh, the, the songs yeah. in most cases, so the structure, everything's written, and then that producer is the magic maker. Yeah, that's that's great. And yeah, Michael Slovis was a real treat to talk about, and he had nothing but good to say about the show. I mean, when he at first he turned it down, like I, I don't want to go to New Mexico. I'm not going to do that. Then they sent him what they overnighted them the whole first season or for half the first season, whatever. He binge watched it and like, okay, where where do I sign up? So that says a lot about their uh, their their production. Uh, here's a question from I believe this one is from Renata. Uh, Renata says, "What's the deal with Romanians and the Dracula and the Dracula connection? Uh, is it is it embraced or laughed at? I feel you should be proud." So um, of course, uh, 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 Romanian history, as presented in many books uh, in Romania and mostly outside Romania, necessarily involves the count. Dracula, uh, following the success of Bram Stokes' uh, novel uh, about that. Now, um, it was a historical character. It was a king of Romania hundreds of years ago, uh, and quite a cruel uh, individual who would like to impale his opponents, for example. But he was a real, real uh, person, a real uh, character. Now, the legend now has evolved to a point where Dracula uh, became a vampire and will uh, act like a vampire and will uh, be able to control the bats and will bite people on the neck and suck their blood. And, uh, um, and you know, I told Eric that he, I'm Romanian. And, uh, you know, all Romanians after midnight, they turn into vampires. So I said, Eric, we must have this show way before uh, midnight because otherwise <laughs> that's right you, you did say that the transformation that's right so but, we had to make sure we get we get done before midnight that's for sure be sure midnight. but to answer the question directly there is a sense of uh, uh, history coming uh, to nowadays to these days in many ways uh, there are i believe 32 castles in romania that claim to be the original and the only dracula's castle Oh, uh, they are touristic attractions now. The, there was an idea at some point to, to build a Dracula land, uh, uh, much like Disneyland, like a theme park, uh, Disney World. So uh, there is a, a, a sense of uh, of uh, Dracula, of, of Lad, the Impaler, the historical figure, and Dracula uh, being part of. Uh, our history and culture. And I, I wouldn't say it's laughed at, but definitely no Romanian will uh, uh, pretend that vampires uh, will jump on you as you land in Bucharest. So <laughs> okay. don't worry about that. I like the, I like the idea of the theme park. That's pretty cool. And, and it's nice to see that it's, it is somewhat embraced, but I, I get it for sure. 
Um, Andrea has a question that was already answered, but I still want to at least just respect her and, and, and mention her question. She'd asked what it was like for your children when you got the role in Breaking Bad. They probably none of them ever knew it was going to have the success that it was going to have. That's for sure. That is true. And um, they're still passionate uh, and like uh, cinematography, watch uh, uh, movies. And uh, they have been part both Patricia and Tiberio. Uh, participated in 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 some in other films in in various capacities, but uh, I have to to say that I'm very proud of the, we Liliana and I were very proud of them. Now they are scientists too. No wonder. Wow. Uh, yeah, Good so Tiberio is uh, at Northwestern University here in Chicago, a research assistant, and Patricia finishing her PhD in Pittsburgh. So we we are a family of. Of scientists, I, I wouldn't say of nerds, but anyways, uh, uh, hopefully some charming nerds. That's good. All of us, but uh, yeah, very I'm, proud of them. And so I'm assuming with with the the brain power that your family has, if you get a new Blu-ray player or something for Christmas, it doesn't take uh, too too long to hook it up. You can handle and hook oh, it up. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That 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 is not a, a problem for us. In fact. Now that you mentioned, for, for Christmas, we all got uh, uh, presents that have something to do with electronics. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I got a, a, a batteries uh, that can uh, charge my phone wirelessly. Nice. And so, so we tend, to, we tend to, to give each other gifts uh, that have to do with electronics or with science in general. But we also love uh, art and sports and other things we are not that bad <laughs> the, what's uh, what's one of your favorite pieces of technology right now because i'm sure I've, the technology must fascinate you and and we'll talk about it later on too in the program how science uh, and technology for science today is such an, an abundance and it's great for you, people getting into it to l l learn and discover now whereas years ago you know the tools were just not there but is there a piece of technology it could be a novelty could be a home appliance of some sort is there, what's one thing that just wows you amazes you with technology today I have to say that anything that is connected to artificial intelligence amazes me. And uh, I work on that. And I also support the idea that we humans can control artificial intelligence in such a way that is beneficial to our society and not detrimental. It's not going to destroy us. It will help us. So everything, for example, to, to answer a question uh, uh, on my cell phone, I like the fact that there is technology in the cell phone that allows me not only to connect, but also guides me when I travel around right. and answer some of my questions. No, as much as I like my cell phone, I need to admit that uh, at times I feel that I, I get addicted to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a hard time uh, refraining myself for, for checking what's happening. But I do think that cell phones have been transformational in the way we live. They changed our life, hopefully for, for, for the better. And there are, many, there are many other things related to artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. robots and uh, uh, computer vision and other things that we do professionally. My son is is very savvy with computer. I, obviously, I'm savvy with computer stuff as well too, but he's very savvy and he's into virtual reality gaming. And you know that's commonplace today. Is coming is coming on very strong. But he showed me something tonight on YouTube. We didn't watch the video. We just saw the thumb, thumbnail. He told me about it. And there's these new VR um, lenses, like glasses and goggles. And depending on how long you look in a certain area and how hard you focus on your focus in a certain area, it, it, it can control different outcomes. Like that is just mind blowing to me. It, it is to me too. So in terms of computer vision between uh, virtual reality that you mentioned and augmented reality. I have an interest in augmented reality too. So imagine that you can use your glasses or your iPad or your cell phone or something to acquire additional information about the object or the person or the building that you're looking at. So okay. you just point it to the building and it will list the architect, the year, the style, everything you want to know. It will point. So that's another area that I, I think can be explored a little bit more. Uh, there was an attempt with the, the Google eyeglasses. Yeah, yeah. But that was abandoned for some reason. But uh, I, 
I would say I like them both. And then my son is 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 interested in drones. Oh yeah, drones. yeah, yeah, yeah. And controlling drones, and we do have a, a project now on controlling swarms of drones that can communicate between themselves to monitor, for example, areas for I don't know fires mm -hmm. or to to control some and provide information. So uh, technology is important, and it plays an in, in, important role in movies too. Sure does. Look at now, like yeah. some of these shots would cost so much money for helicopters sure. and stuff, and beautiful. So you can't tell the difference sometimes. Starting with the CGI. Did you know that the first CGI was uh, appeared in the uh, 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 in 1976? I believe it was a, a movie uh, uh, where they replaced a, a horse and a horse rider with a pixelated image at the time. So it, it's quite older, 50 some years. And nowadays, it, technology, computer science is playing an important role in art. Yes, agreed, agreed. Um, just before we jump over to a super chat question that's coming in here from Saul Goodman Twitter, we're hoping Saul Goodman Twitter is doing well. Saul, uh, the, the account that runs uh, Saul Goodman Twitter, they contracted uh, COVID a while back, so uh, he wasn't doing very good, but yeah, hopefully he's getting better. He's been recovering for quite some time, so hope you're well. But my Sandra Lee here was saying, uh, a lot of people in the chat are saying everyone wants to get together in a big tour bus and go check out this. Uh, we want to travel over to Romania and maybe see the Romanian Disneyland <laughs> if it ever happens. <laughs> that would be funny. Um so here is a, the super chat question from Saul Goodman Twitter. It says, if I can find it again, uh, stopping by to give my support and love uh, to each and everyone. Uh, hi, Marius, Eric, and everyone. Love you all again. Thanks for the warm wishes, as always. So hope you're doing better, Saul Goodman Twitter, and uh, we'll be checking in on you for sure. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Here's a question from Bob. Uh, says uh, Bob's a writer. Bob says, Marius, your character interacts with Walt during a few different seasons of the show. Does Bogdan uh, notice some subtle changes in Walt over time? And does Bogdan uh, recognize that Walt is becoming corrupt? Good questions. Yeah, excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I would say that, yes, the, the character evolves. All characters evolve in this series, which is a... Uh, I would say a mark of a great show and of a great movie. Even in two hours, you have, you can have characters that evolve, that change. And not only Walter White, who becomes, uh, turns uh, into a, a, a greedy uh, uh, mob leader, criminal, far from the very nice and kind chemistry teacher in the beginning. But as you pointed out in the question, the relationship between the two changes. If you want, the balance of power changes. In the pilot, Bogdan was Walter's boss, mm -hmm. could tell him what to do, could ask him to wipe down cars, to do whatever. Uh, then somehow they were in a negotiation stage episode four or so, uh, so on equal foot. You know, you have the buyer, you have the seller, uh, negotiating, give more, give less, uh, trade, the compromise. While towards the end, the balance of our changes. Yep. Remember the scene where Walter White takes the $1 bill uh, that's framed, breaks the, the glass? As is. And, and so this balance changed. And I hope that uh, the way I played uh, Bogdan reflected this change. No doubt, no doubt that Brian Cranston was masterfully uh, uh, creating the, a character that evolves dramatically across these seasons. But their relationship to, to change. I, I have to say, thank you. A very good question. Interesting. Yeah, that, that was good. And what a complete, uh, pardon my Canadian French, but what a dick move by Walter White to take Bogdan's first dollar, you know, <sighs> first hard, I mean, that would have been a hard earned dollar. Uh, the, that first dollar is always the hardest to make. Goes and buys a, a, a soft drink, you know, <sighs> drinks a soft drink. Like that was a dick move. Yeah, you know, that was revenge. I sure was. Yeah, oh, so no, when you tell somebody that, you know, I don't think you, you can manage, but if you don't manage, you can send your wife. Yeah. You can expect some retaliation. Yeah, that was that was a low blow. Yeah, that any was, any man that hears that is like, you know, your your ego and your, your manliness is just 
pulled out from underneath you. Uh, here's a question, a different style question. This is from Elizabeth Coleman. Uh, says, did you ever go hiking in Los Alamos? And if so, what were your favorite hikes? Oh, yes. So living in Los Alamos was a, was a, a, a wonderful time in our life. We spent 13 years there. In fact, uh, the last year or so, uh, we, we also lived in, in Santa Fe a little bit before uh, living to Chicago. It's a small town on top of a mountain of a mesa. Uh, uh, you know, hope you know what it's a, it's a mountain that has a flat platform on, on the very top. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite uh, uh, beautiful forests and uh, uh, trails to, to hike. So we would go with my family and I uh, and uh, over the weekends and, and take long walks uh, to some uh, areas. One that we liked very much was close to Valle Grande, the Great Valley, which is maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour driving away. Beautiful, beautiful area, beautiful uh, uh, trails. What, what, what can I say? It's, it's a charming place. It, it, one can visit Los Alamos, same as Santa Fe and Albuquerque, where Breaking Bad was set. And there are many interesting uh, uh, aspects of that region, New Mexico, if you haven't been there. They even offer tours of the Breaking Bad uh, locations, where it was filmed, uh, the car wash that I used to own, yeah. and uh, the house where uh, Walter and Skyler live. Yeah. So one, one can visit these areas. I definitely want to check it. I'm actually, I'm hoping I'm going to try to call a favor and, uh, or whatever it is, whatever you want to call it and talk to Tom next year. And, uh, when, if, when COVID's better, when we had the vaccines and things like that, say, Tom, can you sneak me in on set? I want to come down to New Mexico and poke around and have a look around and enjoy some of the local cuisine as well, too. I want to, I would definitely want to take in some of the cooking. It and is. Yeah, it is uh, uh, very, uh, New Mexico cuisine is different from Tex-Mex mm -hmm. and from, uh, uh, Mexican cuisine. It's, it's very good. It's one thing they don't do, so I recommend chili or burritos and uh, uh, with red or green chili, beautiful flavor, wonderful flavors and so on. One thing they don't do, uh, contrary to the movies, people don't throw pizzas on the roof of their homes. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, uh, 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 it's, it's a very, very interesting area to visit. My son, I'm going to segue for a second. My son shared this really funny video of um, people doing parodies of uh, these shows. And actually, it wasn't a parody. It was it was real Walt and Jesse uh, when Walt went over to Jesse's uh, you know house one time. And uh, instead of Walt, Jesse and Walt are playing a, a PlayStation 5. They're sitting there playing PlayStation, and they're playing Spider-Man. And then um, Walt gets really mad, whatever, uh, and he storms out of out of his house. And then you see him out of his house. Instead of throwing the pizza up on the roof, he throws the, the PlayStation. It flies, flies out of the box. And they did a real, it's some amateur, but good CGI. And the PlayStation bounces up on the roof of the house. It was just so, I'll send you the link after to watch it. It's really funny. It's like 15 yeah. seconds long. It's really funny, though. But, yeah, I'm going to check out that cuisine for sure. I, I love to eat. Um, now, this is a great question. This is from my friend Eamon, and I'm not saying the other questions are great. All these questions are great. Um, Eamon helps me a lot with a lot of the technical stuff here on the show sometimes. And a lot of our actors, most of them, I'd say, um, I'm just going to say a number, maybe 85% of the people that have been on our show, of the actors, they get a death call at some time. You know, you're gone. You know, Michael McCann, you're, you're gone. You know, uh, um, he says, breaking the pattern of the death call question, what was it like not getting a death call? So in a way, I had a, 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 an event that was not exactly a death call. And let me tell you what, because it's, it's difficult to characterize. So, but it was a, a mix, uh, uh, something that gave me, created in, in me mixed feelings. At the end of uh, the last scene we shot in episode four or six with uh, Michael Slovis was the director mm -hmm. and Brian Cranston was there. It was a scene in the at the car wash, uh, and uh, handing the keys. Maybe you guys remember when I was oh, handing yeah. the keys to 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 Walt, and and uh, we shot that. Uh, took us quite a while, and when it was done, Michael uh, Sovis said, "That was beautiful. You guys are great." And now. Let's say thank you to Marius for a great uh, character and for everything he did in this show. And everybody applauded. 
and congratulated me. And I understood that my role, my participation was intended to, to f- stop there. Yeah, yeah. They had no immediate plans for this character. But then there was so much uh, uh, discussion and rumors about, as I said, Bogdan possibly returning uh, in a revengeful way in the last episode that they somehow kept me at bay and said, we don't know, we don't know where is this, go- this is going, so it may or may not come mm-hmm. back the character. So it wasn't a dead, dead call, as I said. It was a joyful moment because everybody cheered and thanked me and congratulated me, and, uh, and I left with this sense that I made many friends. And I, I am now part of the Breaking Bad family. You're, the, you're so, in the Gilliverse for, for life. Yes, that's and it is a family. It, it's amazing the the from the cast and the crew to the catering to the sound guys, you know the writers. Uh, just it's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing to be part of. And for people like yourself that you you know not got to only act in one episode but multiple episodes. I mean, being right there with Anna Gunn uh, in a set, being right there right. with with uh, Walter White with with Brian Cranston. Did did you pick up any tips at all as a as an inexperienced actor who pulled it off marvelous marvelously? Uh, marvelously um, did you pick up any tips from him? Watching him, you know, get into the zone. Anything that you took? Any takeaways? Yes, yes. And I, I fondly remember you mentioned Anna Gunn and Brian Cranston. Mm-hmm. They were so warm and welcoming and friendly to me, and they gave me tips. Good. Uh, so Brian and Cranston. We, we spoke about many things during lunch breaks, we other thing. And uh, one thing he told me, he said, um, you know, Marius, you don't need to speak so loud. They have outstanding microphones. You can just whisper. Because, you know, having no experience, I would perhaps tend to speak a bit louder than normal, worrying yeah. that the microphones may not pick that up. They have excellent mic, and that was outstanding. From that moment on, I was able to to say things, even whispering, whispering, right? So the uh, do you remember there was a scene where it said, uh, a boss has to be tough, has to make cashiers wipe down cars, mm-hmm. even if they don't want to. Yeah, that was quiet. It's a different delivery. You know, it was, it's menacing. Is it like Michael Slovy said? Yeah, twist. <laughs> but it, it doesn't have to be so loud. And that, that was an outstanding piece of advice. And then Anna Gunn, we had that scene with the $20 million where we were trading uh, the, uh, the car wash. And I don't know, I had this impulse of, um, of somehow pounding the table. Okay. So, you know... So when, when there was a moment, she said, uh, okay, so $800,000, so not to be insulting. And my reply was $20 million. And, and uh, she said, you know what? I don't think it's a good idea to, to, to hit the table, to slap the table, because that will create something that they will not be able to handle in, in the in the sound in department. In post-production, yeah. In post- so I didn't do that anymore. And sure things, minutes later, somebody came and said, could you please not uh, make that noise anymore, whatever it was, because we, can, we cannot capture that without messing up all the sound levels yeah. and all the frequencies and everything like that. Yeah, because I'll so tune... So two examples. But both of them did that with much care, not to hurt my feelings, not to say... Man, you're stupid. You don't know what to, you're doing. Just give me some tips, some yeah. pointing me in the right direction. So I thank them now. That's great. That's great tips for sure. And and it's amazing what uh, shouting or a whisper can do. It, t- it can be taken so differently. And that was really good, even when they don't want to. When you said that, that was that was really good the way that was delivered. A question from Lori. She says, uh, "How are how were you chosen to write the foreword in the book, The Science of Breaking Bad?" So. Uh, just give me a sec. Yeah, so this is the book, The Science of Breaking Bad. I don't know if you see it. Yeah. Uh, by Dave Trumbor and Donna Nelson. Donna Nelson is a professor 
at the University of Oklahoma, and she was a science advisor in the movie. Although I am a chemist and uh, I have a PhD in chemistry, as I, I as, as I say with pride, I would not advise. I did not advise them in anything. They did, and they wrote this excellent book. Now the the editors of the book. This was uh, uh, MIT Press, Massachusetts Institute of Technology Press. They knew me as a scientist, and they made a connection. Okay, so we have a scientist now who is uh, 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 part of the Breaking Bad family, and contact me and said, would you write the foreword for, for, for this uh, book? And I happily did so. Uh, it's, a, it's a good book. It's not highly technical. There are some explanations about the chemistry of the process, which by the way, is portrayed in the series in a way that will not allow a high school student to make methamphetamine. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's a, a secret uh, well, uh, uh, not so well kept anyways. Yeah. So I wrote the, the, the foreword and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, so I started with the fact that Breaking Bad is not a movie about drugs. In fact, it's a movie about greed, how greed, power, money can transform a person. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote a couple of pages and at the end I said, but, you know, if you really want to break bad like Walter... Uh, did you have to learn some chemistry because quoting jc pickman it's chemistry bitch <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how the forward ends you you, you can see <laughs> and i'm surprised that they let that in i put that just as a moment of moment of uh, of the movie but they let it in they that's it perfect in. It ends with its chemistry pitch. I love that. that is the best. I haven't seen that, so I haven't read it. So that's good. Uh, a couple more questions. We'll be wrapping up. Here is one from Andrea. She said, and I know we, you and I talked off the air, and you haven't seen a lot of Better Call Saul. Uh, but she says, could you imagine being involved in a Better Call Saul slash Breaking Bad spinoff? Wouldn't that be cool? Both would be uh, excellent. Yeah. I um, I found I thought about it, and I I don't I would say that it's unlikely for my character for Bogdan to appear in Better Call Saul because if you remember the scene when Walter and Saul were monitoring somehow activities at the car wash, thinking of buying it, mm -hmm. uh, it it's obvious that the two never met. Yeah. So the one way to to bring uh, Bogdan would be if by accident Saul perhaps washed his car at the car wash at some point as a lawyer or mm -hmm. some, but that would be a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Uh, uh, now the prequel, however, so I don't, I don't think there is a good chance for, for Bogdan to appear in a prequel. If there is a sequel, uh, that that may be life after uh, the final episode, Felina, what happened to several characters. Yeah. After yeah. that, that would be that would be quite interesting, and uh, I would enjoy that. Also, a spin-off, the the I don't know, the rise and fall of Bogdan, the car wash owner. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be tough? I, uh, something yeah, like that. I would enjoy working with the team with Vince and the others at any moment. If if there is a chance, I will jump on it. But otherwise, I do not plan to 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 become a professional actor, as I said. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful moment in my life. I would like to have more like this, but we'll see. Especially we'll see. As, as we said in the beginning, let's hope we bold and give a chance to every everything, every opportunity. And yeah, you said take a chance and you did it and you know, you, you've done it once, you know, you know, and you've conquered, you conquered that. It's like these the plateaus that you talked about climbing and you that's a yeah. plateau and you got to it. That's great. Um, and let me see, there was another question here from Harini. I missed it. Uh, Harini says, Marius, you have an amazing career as a scientist. What are your favorite science? Mo oh, okay. This is good. What are your favorite science moments in Breaking Bad? Okay. So I would say I'm, I'm going to give uh, three examples that uh, uh, may appear to you uh, to be so disjoint and so different that uh, do not add up to a good definition of science. I did like, in, at the beginning of the show, some moments with Walter White as a teacher of chemistry. Mm -hmm. I thought that if it wasn't for the difficult situation 
the character was with the illness and all the problems with the family and everything, he could have been a great science teacher, science teacher. And I tip my hat to all the teachers in general and to the science teachers in particular. So I thought that was a good science moment. Mm -hmm. Then there is, of course, the lab work, the lab work that uh, uh, Jesse and uh, Walt do. Again, full disclosure, don't try to make methamphetamine <laughs> by watching that movie. Yeah. You could try and contact me because I have a PhD in chemistry if you really want, <laughs> but, but, but not by watching the show. Yeah. I, I'm joking, of course. So I think the lab work was orchestrated so well to appear realistic from a chemistry point of view, mm -hmm. but also to be useless, if you want, as a recipe for making drugs. That is not easy. It was convincing uh, uh, to me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at, at least, I, I would say. So, so these are perhaps the most important uh, science uh, scenes or aspects that I would collect uh, from, from Breaking Bad. No, there are other things, of course, that... So knowing that lilies of the valleys are poisonous mm -hmm. and taking advantage of that in a criminal way has a scientific component that I am not proud of in, as a scientist, but I applaud uh, thinking of the creative genius of those who made this series, Vince and the others. Yeah. I think that was spectacular, the way that was done. I'll be sure to share that with Vince. We're going to be getting him back on the show, hopefully very, very soon. I'll tell him that you said that. Uh, and, and that is cool. They didn't take any, they didn't, they didn't leave any stones unturned to what they could try. And it's, it wasn't just taking chances. It maybe yes, maybe it's taking some chances, but everything panned out for the, for those guys and girls that the, the writers and everything it was just ph phenomenal what they did with that show. Amazing. Yes, I, I agree. They had meetings every Tuesday, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, and write a few episodes ahead, but not too many because mm -hmm. they wanted to see how things are evolving if what is the feedback it was very well uh, crafted and quite creative i i would say i i agree 100 percent for sure well listen we're going to wrap up in a second just before we do a few thank yous here number one first and foremost thank you to you a happy new year to you uh kind of a, a weird start of the new year but we're going to get through it but happy new year thank you so much for your time this evening great fan of your work and very proud of you as a dad uh thanks so much and thank you, Eric, and thanks uh, to everybody who took the time to, to listen, to participate. Uh, I wish everybody a good year, a spectacular year that will make us forget some of the bad aspects of 2020. It, it can only go better and it's going to be better. I agree on that 100%. I'm 100% positive on that. Uh, I think things are going to going to make us all stronger very, very soon. So thank you to you uh, for joining us. There's a few other people I'd like to thank as well, too. Um, as I told you off the air, we have a new sponsor for the show here for the year, uh, bobbleheads.com and Warren himself, Warren Royal from Royal Bobbles. It was in the chat. He has a fantastic family and a great business here. Check him out at uh, bobbleheads.com slash Gilliverse. And you can check out everything from the Better Call Saul family and Walking Dead and things like that as well, too. So bobbleheads.com slash Gilliverse. Thank you to our channel members, our Patreon supporters, the people that buy our merchandise that keep the internet going here and everything. If we keep the internet on, we can keep doing these shows. Uh, also want to thank you to Sandra Lee for running the chat efficiently as she always does. Our moderators, Mark was in the chat as well tonight. Thank you so much. We just appreciate everyone uh, checking out the show every week. It's our second season and uh, second year. We're really enjoying it. Next Friday, same time, 9 p.m. Eastern, we're having a return guest, one of our good friends, Julie Ann Emery. Uh, you know her as Betsy Kettleman from Better Call Saul. She's from Preacher and Fargo, and everything she touches turns to gold. We're looking forward to having her back. We had, I'm not, so you don't watch Better Call Saul, but um, there was this couple, the Kettlemans, and they're a very eccentric couple, and, and her husband, um, uh, um, stole embezzled money right and supposedly so they have to hire Saul Goodman and, and so on to, to whatever and and it was just such a funny funny dynamic character and we had them both on um 
Craig and Betsy Kellerman on the show in character. So we did 30 or 60 minutes of the actual, it'd be like having bogged on, being bogged on for 60 minutes. It was so fun. But she's going to be coming back as herself. So we get a different side of the actor. So that's going to be good. So we'll look forward to that. Hit up our Instagram at instagram.com slash inside the Gilliverse. Subscribe if you're new here. We will work just as hard to keep you as a subscriber as we did to get you as one. Thank you again, bobbleheads.com and everyone else. We'll see you next Friday right here on Inside the Gilliverse. And until then, thank you so much and cheers. Thanks again for tuning in to Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. Be sure to check back each week for more great discussions and interviews with cast and crew from Breaking Bad El Camino and Better Call Saul. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends.